Hi, I'm Michael Hill with Canine Chronicle TV, and I am virtually here today with Doug Johnson and Jamie Hubbard of Classix Kennels, famous for their Clumbers, Sussex, Welsh Springer Spaniels, and English Toy Spaniels. Um, so we are going to talk about how you guys got started in dogs, um, you know, some highlights of your careers in dogs, what you guys are doing now, and um, you know, help us learn a little bit more about your specific breeds today. So why don't we start off with how you guys got started in dogs? Well, my first, I've been in dogs for practically my whole life. Um, I worked at a vet clinic as a young kid and just um, happened on a Clumber Spaniel that was boarding there. And I was intrigued because they were different. They looked different and they didn't look like just any other animal. I didn't know anything about purebred dogs at the time. I was 14, 15 years old. Oh, wow. And I did that before every day I, before I would go to school. I would stop in and clean kennels and things like that. But um, I found this breed unique and I just started to do some research. And then for my um, 15th or 16th birthday, I think it was my 16th birthday, I asked my parents to get me a clumber. And that's sort of how it started. Did you show that dog? Yes, and he finished his championship. I did that all my, by myself, and oh, wow. the breeder was a great mentor and friend to me, and she sort of taught me the ropes of you know how, how to do it. How do we do those mm -hmm. things? Still so you started from the be mm -hmm. you started from the beginning, doing it all yourself, grooming, handling. <clears throat> and, well, the and breeds you that I am interested in, the breeds that we breed, they're not you know they're not handler heavy. So mm -hmm. most people can show them successfully. Uh, and fortunately, over the course of you know, 35 years, they are competitive on a group and best in show level, even owner handled. When you have dogs you know, of superior quality, they are recognized. So you, it doesn't really require a handler. I love that. So it's a great breed for somebody who might want to get started in the sport of dogs. Sure, I mean, we're, we acknowledge that our pond is small and that you know it's different than the english springer spaniel pond or the golden retriever pond it's a smaller pond and it does help when you breed to you know such a high level you get kind of uh seen faster i think sure sure with the, with the minor breeds that makes total sense jamie how did you get started in dogs yeah, I mean, of course, you know, my background is completely different. Uh, you're growing up, uh, born in Australia. Yeah. My, my parents were the first ones in the family to get involved with the dogs. So they initially had basset, well, they had basset hounds. I was nine years old at the time. I remember going to dog shows um, with them, sometimes thrown a dog to go into the ring, usually dragged around by one of the basset hounds. And I, it, the dog showing aspect really fascinated me. Um, and actually to this day, I'm the only one in our family that remains um, in the sport of dogs. Wow. I, I kept within the hound group initially. I purchased my first dog um, with money that I had saved. I remember she was $300. Um, hmm. She was a long haired dachshund. I also um, purchased a smooth hair dachshund. Um, but then I was probably about 12 or 13 when I was at a dog show and I saw a lady walking around an American Cocker Spaniel. And he was a party color dog, black and white. And I just fell in love with the breed. The dog himself was actually imported from Harriet Camps, from mm -hmm. Camp American Cockers here in this country. And that began my involvement in that breed, which is probably what I was more known for in Australia. So I created my own breeding program, um, a lot of success with them. So that's mm -hmm. kind of where I was in my, in my world in Australia for, you know, a good 20 years. Wow, wow. And Doug, at what point did you get started breeding? Did you breed that first dog or was that a more of a delayed involvement? Yeah, no, I mean, I think like a lot of first people's first animal, um, he taught me a great deal. He taught me how to show, he taught me about the sport, you know, the basics, but he wasn't of the quality that would, you know, want to be used in a breeding program. I 
got a bitch while I was in college from the same breeder and she became my foundation bitch and I had a litter from her I mean beginner's luck that's the litter that Brady came in that went best in trouble Westminster mm. um, but wow. I was only the conduit there I mean I had this bitch that came from 25 years of breeding I bred to a dog that my breeder said you should use this dog on that bitch and see what you get and we raised these beautiful puppies and one went to clients of Jane Myers and you know was able to go best in show fat fabulous dog a dog that would mm -hmm. still be competitive today uh, and that was 1996 so yeah that's a hell of a start in dogs <laughs> yeah not bad not bad <laughs> actually he, he had a very famous sister who also won the national specialty and was a multiple best in show winner and for a while she was the top winning bitch of all time Joan Brian, Brian and Nancy Martin so that was a really a, a record-breaking litter and you know you it's sort of like where do you go from there it was a, but how do you top that <laughs> me as a young person to you know some sort of notoriety and at least to sure. put you on the map sure and what point did you guys meet up how did you guys first connect well, Jamie wrote to me to buy a puppy. Yeah. Really? And in fact, in, in fact we had met once before. Um, I was judging here. Um, it was actually the first time that I was judging here in this country. And uh, friends of mine said, hey, do you want to go and see um, a kennel of Combras and Sussex Spaniels? And, mm -hmm. you know, the initial reaction was, well, that's not very exciting. And because of the two breeds involved but then they said who it was and i was like oh absolutely i do want to go see that kennel because i mean everyone knew of the classics kennel so yeah we went and um looked at the dogs and um spent an afternoon together and then i went back to australia and that's where kind of how we first met and i was going to get some dogs and here we are today <laughs> the, do the dogs were the connecting factor there. Oh, yeah, no question. Absolutely were. I love that. And um, you said you have also, uh, you also were involved with the Sussex early on. How did you transition into those other breeds along to the, you know, Welsh Springers and the English Toys? Well, I think what happened, I got a Sussex in college uh, and we bred from her and then you know, you sort of just keep walking down that path. And you, when you have these minor breeds, breeds with low entries, you have A, a lot of time on your hands. You go to the dog show, you're the, generally the only one. And yeah. so you would be able to watch other dogs, other people, and you see other breeds that are intriguing to you. The Welsh Springers came much, much later. Um, and I happened to be at a kennel in Sweden that was very famous for the breed, the Don's Kennel. They're internationally very well known. And I, there were two homes involved in that kennel. And what they had a beautiful dog in one kennel and a beautiful bitch in another kennel. And I had suggested that maybe they breed those two together and I would take one. And they did that and we got a dog named Don's Full Fig. And Fig became a prolific producer in this country produced uh, several best uh, uh, several national specialty winners and um, you know best winners bitch and many 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 times at a national it was a very very good sire and that just sort of sparked an interest plus I think we wanted something a little bit more competitive I think mm -hmm. when you breed one breed so successfully that you need other challenges and I think yeah. that by breeding multiple breeds it helps you stay competitive within all of the breeds. They kind of feed mm -hmm. off each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, did you did you find that there was different approaches you had to use within the respective breeds as far as how you would pair a male and a female and choices you would make like that? I think no question. You know, especially what Jamie and I have discovered with the English toys is that you know the toy that breed in particular 
we have been able to breed very closely. Mm -hmm. uh, Father-daughter breedings, multiple father-daughter breedings. And that was also done, I learned that in Sussex Spaniels because that was able to be done there. Mm -hmm. In a breed like Clumbers, it was never done. And it, you couldn't get too close, but you didn't want to get too far away. We both really believe in tight line breeding but we have to be cautious of which breed goes too, too close. And Welsh oh, breeders are probably the most open pedigree. Mm -hmm. I okay. think there's more genetic issues in that breed than the other three. Things to avoid. Yeah. I also think with the English Toy Spaniels, when we got involved with them, I mean, we knew that there was going to be a challenge ahead. I mean, two or three decades ago, most people will remember the breed for having poor quality, bad temperaments. We fell in love with a dog um, who went on to win 16 or 17 best in shows. And mm -hmm. we used that dog as our main string in terms of breeding to him. So we did all these multiple close type breedings to create, create our own pedigree because the breed are totally open in pedigree. There's not one related to the next. They don't breed mm. true. I mean, you could try to breed a couple of dogs closely bred together, and you could get five puppies that were completely different from the parents and completely different from each other. So we've spent the last 10 to 15 years breeding back, breeding back, breeding back, and now we can almost guarantee what we're going to get every single time we breed a litter. Well, we wow. like to have, we, we felt like we had to force the genetics to do what we wanted them to do. And the only way to do that was to collect a bunch of dogs that had similar traits that, and none of them were related. So we took those dogs with similar traits and bred them together and then bred them back together. And so Got all it. we've done is sort of, you know, piled on the same genetics. And eventually, uh, several years now later, they are reproducing what they are which is exactly the whole point of the experiment. And we've right. been very lucky because they're healthy too. So we have a genetically clean, but tight pedigree. When we first got involved in the breed, the pedigrees were very random. And it was, you know, this dog bred to that dog that had no similar parents. So it was a mishmash of pedigrees. In fact, it's very funny because we laugh about the fact that, you know, everybody wants to see the pedigree on these English toys. and our theory is why there, there is no pedigree. Yeah, they're, they're just <laughs> all over the place. The other thing that we've done with the English Toy Spaniels, which a lot of the um, original breeders, and some of them are still around, they would never cross the colors. Um, they, would, yeah. they would breed the broken ones together and they would breed the solid ones together. But those colors each have their own um, qualities that are different That's from it. each other. Mm -hmm. So we mix the colors together to get the good from this and the good from that. Um, no one else really does that. And we are okay if, I mean, we don't really get any mismatch. We might get a splash of white sometimes on a black and tan, mm -hmm. but we're thinking ahead. We're not thinking about that particular puppy that we're producing. Sure. We're what that then produce down the, down the you know, was well, the main the concern for that the miss marks? Is that the reason they never did that? Oh, sure. Yeah, they. Yeah, I mean, you speak to someone who breeds black and tan and rubies, they would never breed to a party color English toy spaniel because of that very reason. Well, and I think it translates to some sporting breeds too because you have a breed like English cockers and there is a definite difference between the party colors and the solids. And it is a very rare breeder that has the guts to mix the two together. And I do think that you lose qualities by isolating those genes based on variety. And I think when you mix a solid with a party, the goal is to get some of what's going on good over here with what you have over here. And I mean, first of all, that's the whole point of breeding. But when you have this color factor, it's a risk. Sure, you're going to get a risk. And you sure. do risk 
mismarked, but at the, at the, it doesn't mean the whole litter will be mismarked. We've been right. fortunate because we also started with a dog who didn't carry all the colors. So we got kind of lucky there. And in doing that, we've kind of locked that out. Mm -hmm. So we've been lucky. It's like a real, real life practice in genetics. And it sounds like you guys have been able to do enough crosses to see how those things are playing out as opposed to jumping ship after one litter because of a mismark or something like that. Right. I think too, we've been really, first of all, we are breeders and we breed, we breed five to 10 litters a year mm. across four breeds. And if you were to include the breedings that we either co-breed and or mentors slash advise, we're over 20 easy of breeds that are populating or breedings that populate these breeds. So wow. we have a lot of diversifying that we can do. That said, it's very interesting to be able to do some risk breedings for color, for example, and see what happens. Right, right. So far, so, yeah. And it sounds like you guys have a network of co-breeders and, and friends and, you know, uh, contemporaries and dogs that enable you to keep up that volume of breeding, right? That's actually one of the most important parts of doing this, is having your satellites in different areas, not just within the country. I mean, we have people that we work with over in Europe, I mean, all over the place. The English Toy Spaniels right now, I mean, we're working with a lady um, in her kennel in Russia, and she got her best dogs from a dog that we sent over to Europe. And she got a puppy, and she started her own breeding program, has produced beautiful dogs, and now her and, and us are working, to, you know, sending the dogs backwards and forwards. Oh, I love that. Who actually have a very similar look uh, and, to a certain degree, similarities in pedigree. Huh. Yeah. Even, I mean, even though on the other side of the world. Yeah, and it's to everyone's advantage at that point because, you know, we don't compete with them. Um, right. So we get to share the wealth, really. Um, in right. fact, our, our good dog that plays in the group of the garden, the black and tan dog, I mean, he's in Russia now, uh, and his son is in Russia that we bred. So, you know, as soon as uh, we can get out of, out of the country, we'd like to have <laughs> But, um, I mean, so there's a, there are advantages to breeding, you know, with people like that. It's certainly different. I mean, you know, you have, your breeds are much more uh, popular. So it, it is different because the, it's a much smaller microcosm. And yeah. you can you can make huge impacts on these breeds in terms of improvement just because it's a much smaller playing field. So I mean I think yeah. that's that's one of the differences for sure. Yeah. No, I've never thought about that, but that makes total sense where you and, and there's not as many con contributing other factions in the breed that might be taking it another way when you're trying to take it one way. Well, the diversification on certain breeds make it a real challenge. I mean, look at golden retrievers, for example. You know, there's millions of golden retrievers. And to form a line and keep a line of healthy dogs that look alike, that act alike, is a rarity. I mean, the pedigrees are wide open. And, you know, right. we, we get sort of controlled by an animal activist mantra of, you know, the dominant sire or, you know, you have to open up your pedigrees. I mean, all of the things that sort of go against the locking down of quality genetics so that you're reproducing quality easily. And consistently. Uh, right. And so you kind of it becomes uh, a much more of a challenge. Uh, yeah. Connie Miller, who bred some wonderful golden retrievers for the last 50 years, I'll never forget her saying, you know, she has these line bred bitches that she said, I could breed them to anything and they'll reproduce themselves. And I always thought that was a clever thing to say because yeah. 
we have to rely on our bitches to give to a breeding, I think, three quarters of their genetics. And I always say I'm looking for a, a very good dog with blank semen. I just need him to get them pregnant. Let the right. bitch get everything else. Right. I love that. And I, I, I love that you're talking about learning that from another breed because I'm sure with your the number of shows that you've been to both as an exhibitor and judging as well, you get to see those trends played out in various breeds all over the world, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, you learn, you should learn something all the time. I mean, you never stop learning. This is a life learning event that we're doing. Uh, right. And so doing that, you take from others or watch others and some will have successes and some will have failures and you can learn from them all and the best breeders do exchange ideas there's no question that jamie and i both feel like you're you you find your biggest supporters and biggest allies away from the breeds you're working with mm -hmm. that makes total sense and uh And uh, and when when you guys are in the ring judging, I'm sure your the quality of, the quantity of breeding that you guys are doing is factoring into your decisions in the ring because you are constantly making those judgments for breeding stock, right? I think that one of the advantages to having a judge that is still actively breeding is that they're judging whatever breed that they're in the ring judging as if they were a breeder themselves. And I know that's how we look at it. If I'm judging a class of golden retrievers, they go in order one, two, three, four, in the same order that I would take them home to either use at stud or right. put in the popping box. So your mind says, this is how I think as a breeder, this breed should be. That's the order every single time. That is the advantage of, of a active breeder judging dogs today. Yeah, there's it's not no about showmanship or presentation. It's about what's going to be useful in your program. Not for us. I mean, we are evaluating breeding stock. Unfortunately, not every judge judges the same way that we think. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, I don't, I mean, and, and Jamie and I are very similar in our approach, uh, almost exactly. Except for, I mean, we don't always judge exactly the same because right. we have different, our, different interests and things. But... You know, in terms of showmanship or putting on a performance, right. it's very little consequence to me. Um, if they are doing what they're supposed to do, of course you're not here with something that, that's atypical in temperament or behavior. But for the most part, it is an evaluation of how close that is to the standard and the purposefulness of the animal in a breeding program. I had uh, this very weekend back to judging for the first time in many months, uh, entry of 120 plus golden retrievers. And I put a bitch winner's bitch that ha had so much virtue for that breed for breeding. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was, you know, built right and strong and sturdy, moderate. I mean, nothing fancy, which we hate in that breed. Um, and she just had a great deal of quality for the breed. And we love to find that animal that is right. a vessel for the breed to move forward. And they don't bring some tragic flaw or counterfeit breed type to the next four generations as a result. They do no harm. Right. We're picking on golden retrievers, so while we're at it, we won't I mean, talk about it. But, but I mean, I was I watched I watched the breed at the end of the breed this weekend, and not the day Doug judged them, but it's very easy to put up the flashy, big open side gate. You know, they fly around the ring. Yet, if they aren't your vision of the type that that breed should be. It doesn't matter how flashy and how much reach and drive they have, because I told one person in a different breed, any mixed breed can move well. But if they don't look like the breed, what's the point? So 
you might sure. come across as judging, you know, once every so often, and we may not put up the best mover in the ring, but we will put up the typiest in our opinion. Right. And that's probably um, a testament to a bloodline that produces consistent type as opposed to an open pedigree where you're going to have more variations in sure. that specific type. Exactly. As far as, um, you know, with your particular breeds, what are some key things right now that you would be looking for when you're in the ring judging for, for a dog that is valuable for those breeding programs? So for clumbers, I mean, they are subject to the trends of the day, which is a generic, um, short, backed, up on leg, common white spaniel. And we really gravitate towards something that is low and long, massive, deep, um, that is round throughout. I mean, those are what I think are the most appealing things. Um, and, and those are the unique qualities of the breed. We don't believe in something that I wrote a lot about, is this Americanization of show dogs, where they kind of all act and look the same. They might be right. similar in size, or different in size, but everything else about them is the same. They, you just blow the model up. Right. And we don't like that. You know, we, we like and look for unique. Uh, right. I have, uh, we had a wonderful uh, Welsh bitch that won the national many years ago, a very smart lady that did the breed, and I remember her discussing unique qualities of this bitch and how different she was from the entry. And I took that into my brain, and what, Jamie and I both speak to the unique qualities of these animals, individual breeds with individual breed characteristics. So we look for something unique. I mean, what do you what do you think? Well, I just I think with the clumbers, I mean, we're starting there. It's very easy to see a clumber that is lacking of the virtues that we believe they should be. Right. The 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 flatness, the up on leg, the moving around with big reach and drive like an English Springer Spaniel. I mean, I have seen dogs win with those attributes. Yet for us, it is foreign for us. But as someone from outside the breed who is now judging the breed will easily be misled by a flashy dog of incorrect type. Just because it's visually appealing does not mean it's correct for that breed. Very, very true. Well, you know what? When you learn multiple breeds, you are taught, you, they're, you're taught about form and function. But you also hear many times, it's the same animal standing as it is moving. And in clumbers, that is not always the case because there's some undulating skin um, movement throughout the body. They're supposed to roll. Um, so there's a difference there that's not always appealing to the masses in terms of sure. that, that tightness. So. Right. The clumbers are a challenge. They're a challenge to breed. It's a very difficult breed to breed, but it's also a difficult breed to judge and really understand. A very good judge, a lovely person, I always laugh, and she laughs at herself. She came to a seminar, and there were four dogs, three good ones and one bad one, and she said, I love this one over here. That's my best to breed, and he was the worst of the lot, and he was up on leg, and flat-backed and, you know, strong and sound, but right. he was wrong, you know, he was like a giant American cocker, <laughs> and, you know, I said, you, you are, it's, you're a product of what you like, and, you right. know, if you cut them square, and if you're used to tight, this is not the breed for you. Yeah, it's going to scream wrong in your head, even though it's right. Right. That, that's, that's so good. Tell me about the Sussex. Well, I think the Sussex, first of all, I think Sussex are having a heyday. Uh, I think they are looking good. The last 15 years of Sussex, there's some very good quality in a breed that's really an endangered species, okay? So there's, you know, hundreds of them in the world, not thousands. Uh, so you're, you're talking a very, very small breed. I think that 
Uh, again, I look for a long, low level. Uh, their color is unique. Um, Jamie and I saw a dog this weekend that was as the most beautiful golden liver you've ever seen. It is hard to get. It requires sunlight and conditioning. So if they live in the house, they never have it. This dog had beautiful golden highlights throughout his body. I think they're sounder today than they've been. I think their dentition is better. It used to be that 85% of that breed was undershot. And I think wow. you're seeing more and more of them with good bites. Yeah, I would say that, I mean, generally speaking, half of them, half of the litter will be undershot. Don't you think that's, oh, yeah. Yeah, so, and you grow up these puppies who have a regular scissor bite, and they'll get to four, four. five, six months of age, and they're done. I mean, they go under oh. and they never come back. So that's one of the biggest challenges with the Sussex. So, I mean, what do you do as a breeder when all your bitches are under shot, which right. is a possibility? Do you then stop breeding them? Because if you do, they will be extinct. You will never see them again. And so the challenge for some of the breeders is to then decide, should they be showing them? And should they be finishing them? And then putting them in the whelping box because they may produce a litter of... Yeah, the, it's a real challenge. The bites are a challenge. We, we love the good bite. We look for that. It's really the only breed in the group where I don't really evaluate the mouths because I know the challenges. Ideally, they would have a scissor bite. It just doesn't always happen. And we bred ourselves out of them because we set this bar so high that they had to have a good bite, but right. I mean, we're, we're the casualty there that we, we realized that, well, you actually, you can't do that. So they have right. to be, they have to be included. My recommendation, because I, I give seminars on the breed is that you judge the dog in its entirety. Um, I would, I always tell people place the class one, two, three, four, before you pass out ribbons, before you point, go back and go over their bites and see if you're desperate to change your mind. Mm. Uh, because I would recommend not changing your mind, uh, but you may you say, I can't, can't use that one because it's got a bad bite. But I've done the national several times. And the last time you find plenty of quality with good mouths. I think bites have really improved, but it certainly was for a long time a challenge there. Definitely, especially yeah. in such a small, small gene pool too. Yeah, and you know, Tiny. they are valuable. I mean, you have to have dogs of quality that have flaws, um, and every dog has a flaw. It's just to what degree. And so, even you know, these dogs of ours that have gone best in show at Westminster, we can change things. And oh, I wish this dog had a better this, or whatever. Now, they don't have bad mouths, but they certainly have, there's always room for improvement on anything. Right. They're living things. Right. So tell us next about the English toys. I know we talked about them earlier, but right now in the breed, what, were, what would be some key points that you look for for value in the ring? Can I stop yeah, this? No, because, um, you know, traditionally someone would tell you that they're a head breed and mm -hmm. We um, suffered um, through a national of a judge that only judged them on their heads. And it was not a pretty picture. I mean, let's just put it that way. The breed, the breed has evolved from just breeding them for head. I mean, you have to have good temperaments. They've got to be, I mean, let's not forget that they're Spaniels. They have to be sturdy. They should be able to walk. Um, we found this national that I'm talking about, n the winners could not walk. They were crippled. They had poor temperaments, tails down. And actually, and a, and a beautiful dog of ours actually won the national that particular day. And we were still horrified with the whole event. So when, with the English toy Spaniels, when someone says to us they're a head breed, we will argue that point. Yes, the head is important. But there is so much more to them because let's not forget that they are a spaniel and they're a companion. So right. they go beyond just what you see when they're sitting on your lap. Sitting there. Right. Yeah. They still have to be functional. Yeah. So that's why we've spent so much time 
improving their temperaments, improving their walking ability, um, their bone, their substance, and still keeping, you know, really pretty heads. It's a balance for sure. It is. I mean, there's no question, you know, all these breeds have, you know, the head has 40 different characteristics to them, you know, but there's, always, there's you know, a front leg and um, there's, you've got, there are other parts of the body, a body, uh, ribbing. The, the English toy has a unique, distinctive head. There's no question about it. It's actually very hard to get the proper head with the beautiful upsweep sweep of jaw and the, the nose placement correct. All of those things are absolutely vitally important. But we don't really breed solely for just the head because we want them to act and behave like a toy spaniel, not a spider. And we don't like them to crawl on their bellies and you know, get afraid and look up and we don't like yeah. any of that. And that's part of that breed too. So it's important to have a balance where they are spaniel in temperament, in bulk, in body. Um, John Ramirez wrote a wonderful article that I was reading when Jamie and I did a, a seminar for a Russian um, judge's education during the COVID. Mm -hmm. And so in doing that, I read this wonderful article where he said, you know, they have a body like a pug. Well, I've been saying that. I thought it was my own creation. Mm -hmm. I'm giving him some credit there. But I thought, well, that's exactly what I've been thinking is, you know, they're, they're, they're built like a pug. So mm -hmm. they need to have roundness and volume and bone. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of frail, spidery type. Well, that's... A, a different spaniel that's going towards your happy on Japanese, Japanese chin. chin. Yeah. yeah. And they all became a similar, they're all from similar descent, but right. this would be heavier in bone. So it's a challenge for sure. It's a very challenging breed. We adore the breed. We're having a great time breeding them. Um, right. But you, you have to have balance overall. Yeah. And I would say right now, Michael, that the biggest challenge in the breed for every breeder in this country is their length of body. Yes. I mean, definitely. we fight, I mean, they're supposed to be compact, copy, not long. And I guarantee you, there's, I mean, I, there might be one or two compact, copy, square English post spaniels in the ring yeah, right they, now. Wow. The breeders have mastered long. They're good at long. Uh, they're, they're supposed to be short, but we are really good at getting long. And we're in the right? yeah. I mean, Ours, I mean, we would shorten a couple of them up for sure. Um, but, they, I mean, there's just so many parts to them that right. sometimes the best one overall has long. to be longer than you would prefer. Got it. Especially in a challenging breed like that, sometimes you do have to accept the weak points for now and build on it, right? Yeah. You know, it's, one. it's, it's only one, it's one thing. And you know, okay, so you work on that, but the good news is that you're checking other boxes. You know, you've got right. them moving, they're happy, uh, right. they're round body, they've got bone. So, you know, you'll shorten them up over the next four or five generations. And like we talked about stamping in that consistency by locking in the bloodline as opposed to having the variation from before. Exactly. Yeah. Love that. Now let's talk about the Welsh Springers. Well, the Welsh are the newest um, of the sporting spaniels that we've gotten involved with. And that breed, I'm really enjoying that breed. The Clumbers are so hard to breed. It's a joy to breed these other breeds that are so much easier. Yeah. Um, they don't require the same amount of manpower. Um, the right. Clumbers we sit with you know, for days on end to make sure that they're healthy and it's a three or four week process. The Welsh are much better mothers. Uh, we, we are looking for a beautiful headed animal um, with good bone and body that's, you know, a square within a, with a square within a rectangle. So they're not as long cast as some of the other spaniel breeds that we um, work with. Um, it's such a beautiful breed of, of distinct color, that gorgeous white. 
it created a sort of a small family of here blood. I was going to say that yeah, there is a type um, that is from Europe that we have gravitated towards, and you start from within that stuff. The Don's dog, Doug imported, yeah. he would be at least 20. Yeah, 20 years ago. And the Scandinavian type is very distinct. I think probably right now, we would be one of the only ones that are breeding that type time and time again. Yeah, I mean, we kind of focus on that. And, you know, the breed in other countries is very popular. It's a very popular breed in, really? you know, Scandinavia. Uh, and all throughout Europe, they have huge entries. So it was our um, desire to get into something that was a little more competitive and to, you know, participate in a breed where there were multiple people breeding this animal. And it wasn't just, there weren't just five breeders. There were maybe 25 breeders. Uh, so that's kind of fun. I think that we really do like that look mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's a breed that is also um, Megan Bysaw and her mother Susan Reese they I learned I got my first Sussex from them uh, which was in the early 80s mid 80s probably and so it's kind of come full circle because they're very well known in this country for Welsh Springers and we've been oh. fortunate to use a lot of their dogs so it was kind of a cool for, full circle moment for me. The, the family stays together. <laughs> yeah, and you know, they breed um, for their, she's a real structure person. And so it's been kind of interesting to come that from a different angle as someone who's, we focus on type. Yeah. And we require, we require soundness, but we will sacrifice a little bit of soundness for right. structure. The interesting thing I think that this breed has taught us is to elevate the health testing across the board yeah. for all of our dogs right. because the Welsh Springer Spaniel people are right. such, uh, they're really good at they're, testing. They're excellent at it. I mean, they, they do make you think, well, what sh should I be doing more in my other breeds? Right. Because... Mm -hmm. You know, they and they have a, a bigger gene pool than we do, especially in the Congress, than the Congress. But they have made us think we should be looking for definitely more and more. Health wow. wise. Love that. Well, and I think you said you have some Welsh that we can take a look at. We have a beautiful Welsh bridge we can show you. Wonderful. Well, it will be great to see that. We're going to close out this portion by just thanking you for sharing all of this fascinating information from a wealth of experience that's hard to find anywhere in the world.